<clears throat> what we've been doing um, trying to image the thalamus um, and what we've found so far. And so to start with a very brief overview and a motivation of why the thalamus is interesting and why so many people are interested uh, in looking at it, uh, the thalamus has several key functional roles in the brain. Uh, it's known to be a hub, so relaying information uh, to the cortex from uh, lower body regions uh, and also modulating uh, the transmission of information, not only to the cortex, but in between uh, cortical regions. Uh, it's also um, very important in uh, regulation of sleep and wakefulness states. Uh, and so very diverse uh, functional functions and roles. And in this, in these seminars, we've already seen uh, plenty of good research looking at very diverse aspects uh, on this more functional uh, side. Uh, structurally, um, a very important feature of the thalamus. So in all, it's, the thalamus is a relatively large structure um, with about, um, see, you see my mouse, right? Uh, with about four centimeters in length. So it's one of the biggest structures in the brain. Uh, but it is composed, subdivided uh, into more specialized nuclei that are themselves much smaller uh, on the order of millimeters. Uh, and, and these have very specialized functions and connections to different parts of the cortex. Um, and they are very re relevant. Uh, there's been plenty of research showing that alterations in disease, namely, for instance, in uh, the volume of certain uh, of these nuclei, um, have been associated to uh, disorders such as schizophrenia and multiple sclerosis. Uh, and um, alterations in functional connectivity um, have also been associated, for example, to schizophrenia, uh, potentially suggesting that we could find perhaps interesting biomarkers uh, um, in, these, in these types of parameters uh, to help us diagnose more uh, with more sensitivity um, and characterize better uh, these disorders. Uh, at the level of intervention, uh, it's also been found that uh, interventions in uh, specific nuclei can have a positive impact in disorders like tremor uh, and epilepsy, be it with actual ablation of tissue um, in, the, in the thalamus, for example, in the ventral intermediate nucleus uh, for tremor, or uh, by um, electrical stimulation in the case of epilepsy, for example, for the anterior nucleus. Uh, so plenty of motivation uh, to look into the thalamus. Uh, and of course, um, the ability to distinguish these nuclei, uh, if we think of what would I call the gold standards, uh, we'd have to go into uh, either histology, which is a great method to look at the anatomy. Um, it allows extremely high spatial specificity, allows us to look at different uh, structural properties uh, um, using different stains. Um, or uh, on the more functional side with invasive electrophysiology, so deep brain electrodes that can reach the thalamus and for which we can sample activity. Uh, and if we're interested in specific types of activities, such as related to motor uh, functions uh, in tremor, for example, this allows us uh, to know it's a functional criterion uh, allowing us to know if we are in the right region that is associated with that type of function. Um, but of course, these methods have the obvious uh, limitations. Um, uh, deep brain electrodes are very invasive uh, and histology requires that you'd be dead. So uh, of course, they're not ideal for um, um, widespread use. Um, and that's where imaging comes in uh, with its advantages, of course, of allowing us to do this in vivo and in a non-invasive manner. Challenges would be that we require a relatively high resolution, submillimeter uh, resolution, to be able to start telling apart uh, these nuclei. Uh, and another challenge is getting uh, good contrast. Uh, and I'm showing here two um, relatively conventional uh, contrasts, the T1 weighted on the left and the T2 weighted on the right. These are already acquired at 7T, and you can see the quality is quite good. And the contrast, uh, for instance, between white and gray matter is quite good. But in the thalamus, very little uh, can actually be seen. Um, but of course, plenty of research has been dedicated uh, to this, uh, some of which I'll be talking about covering uh, today. Uh, so uh, there are solutions uh, that have been proposed to get a bit better uh, uh, to overcome this challenge. Um, I will cover uh, some examples of uh, 
notable work that has been done with functional MRI and diffusion MRI, and then I'll get to uh, structural MRI modalities where I'll go a little bit more in depth. That's really the core uh, of, the, of, the, um, of this talk. Uh, so starting with functional MRI, people have looked uh, at this from a functional connectivity perspective. Uh, the idea, um, very generically, I uh, can define functional connectivity as a co-variation in fMRI signal between different regions of the brain across time. Uh, there are many variations of this, uh, but the idea is to look at co-variation between different subregions of the thalamus or even voxels uh, and the cortex. And this is a great example from uh, Hale and colleagues um, where they uh, acquired fMRI from subjects at rest and um, looked at, uh, so defining regions of interest that are uh, functionally meaningful in the cortex. So regions of the cortex that are known to be dedicated to specific functions uh, and using that as seed to look at uh, which voxels in the thalamus uh, best co-vary with those and uh, recovering um, uh, regions, so zones of uh, high correlation or high covariation that, um, seem to relate well with what we'd expect uh, from the anatomy. Here in the same work is a different approach. So not C-based, but using uh, what we call ICA, independent component analysis, uh, focusing on a region of interest um, around the thalamus and uh, then applying ICA to look at essentially networks within the thalamus. What we would traditionally do for the whole brain and mostly get networks in the cortex if you're focused on the thalamus, recovering regions that work uh, uh, together and uh, statistically independently uh, from the others. Um, so sort of thalamic networks, which then uh, seem to be quite consistent with, again, uh, what we'd expect uh, from the anatomy uh, for specific nuclei or groups uh, of nuclei. Um, one other very recent work that I had the, the pleasure to discuss uh, with the authors in OHBM, um, as uh, from Mark Lowe um, and colleagues, they've been uh, looking at a, a similar approach, but uh, at 17 concatenating um, uh, a large group of subjects in, in time after registration, and then looking at these co-variations between uh, different uh, parcels of the cortex uh, and voxels in the thalamus, and also applying some criteria for spatial consistency to obtain um, uh, clusters that are, are more spatially consistent. Uh, it's quite a heavy approach computationally from what I've understood. I haven't understood all the details, but uh, they seem to be able to recover, for example, the ventral intermediate nucleus from data that is resting state data. So uh, quite remarkable. Uh, and they, they're continuing to work uh, on this. Um, on the diffusion side, uh, there's this very uh, famous work from Barons and colleagues. Uh, where they applied probabilistic tractography. So looking at um, uh, what are the most likely uh, pathways uh, in terms of white matter fibers from each uh, uh, voxel in the thalamus to the cortex. Uh, and looking at those distributions, they were able to uh, subdivide the thalamus um, uh, into uh, regions that um, connect uh, the uh, tractography. Uh, two regions of the cortex that we know are, are specific, differentiated according to their function. Uh, more recently, uh, and this is work uh, led by Mary and, and colleagues, um, another work is looking at, um, again, from DTI data, but looking at local diffusion uh, characteristics. So from the DTI data, creating um, these um, orientation distribution functions or ODFs. I don't know this. Thing. Very strong detail, but uh, my colleague right next <laughs> could, uh, could answer questions. But essentially, uh, so looking locally at the diffusion properties, which get uh, represented by these uh, coefficients from these functions. And so each voxel gets a vector of coefficients uh, that can then be used for clustering um, across voxels. Uh, so fully database, applying as well a, a distance um, uh, cost, so to, to get clusters that are uh, localized. Uh, and which seems to be able as well, uh, based on these diffusion properties, to, to um, um, obtain at least groups of nuclei that we know expect to be uh, consistent with, with the anatomy. Um, moving then on to structural MRI, uh, so that would be the main topic. Um, the idea is to um, make use of differences in uh, MRI-related properties across the different nuclei. 
uh, these properties being uh, T1, T2, T2 star mechanical susceptibility. Uh, we typically see that we can get higher spatial specificity uh, with this type of modality, sudden linear uh, specificity. Uh, they're typically faster both to acquire and to process uh, until we actually get maps compared to, for example, fMRI or diffusion. Uh, and from that, uh, as a consequence, we can expect a lower cost of obtaining such maps. Um, and I will be focusing specifically on T1 and magnetic susceptibility, which are the two properties that have been uh, seem to have been the most uh, promising um, uh, or the most valuable um, for this uh, for this objective. Um, and to, so starting with uh, T1 based modalities, uh, the motivation is that uh, we know the thalamus contains both gray and white matter, and we know that T1 is quite sensitive to myelin, which is itself specific to white matter. This is a nice work from uh, Lemaire uh, and colleagues, um, where they um, acquired ex vivo MRI data uh, with a T1 weighting um, on the thalamus, and then um, at such a high resolution that it became quite quite detailed and quite directly comparable to um, histological references uh, from the literature, uh, particularly this one with the myelin stain. And you can see that uh, the main features appearing on the T1 weighting uh, are quite consistent with uh, the myelin staining. Uh, so supporting this idea that myelin is a big driver of these T1 differences. And you can see here, uh, it's hard to see because of all these contours, uh, but this gradient between uh, um, more medial and more lateral regions, which is also uh, supported by uh, the myelin staining. Um, and so in order to exploit these uh, variations in, in these properties, we, most approaches have relied on what we call inversion recovery uh, in the acquisition sequences. Uh, so very briefly, um, this means that we prepare our magnetization with what's called an inversion pulse, uh, and then the recovery, uh, uh, the signal will try to uh, come back uh, to equilibrium. And as it does so, it will do um, with an exponential uh, recovery that is dependent on the T1 of that tissue. tissue. And there we know uh, that white matter and gray matter uh, recover quite differently. So if we acquire image data at a specific uh, time, which we call inversion time, after this inversion, we can then get different weightings of white and gray matter. And that's what's been heavily explored. Uh, so the earliest work that I um, that I uh, found um, with these approaches, but I keep finding new works uh, from from earlier on. Uh, sometimes the keywords are not uh, very easy or very evident, uh, but I keep finding uh, new uh, new articles related to this uh, every time I search. And um, the earliest I found is from 2000, uh, where where the authors were trying what they call this cortex attenuated inversion recovery. Uh, so it's a T1 weighted sequence that tries to um, work at the time where gray matter uh, is crossing the null point. So it will appear uh, quite dark with almost no signal as you can see here. Uh, and this has also been explored at higher fields. So at uh, three Tesla and seven Tesla, Again, uh, you see um, the gray matter getting uh, quite dark and in the thalamus, this uh, medial to lateral uh, gradient. Other authors have instead explored um, uh, nulling of the white matter instead um, with this f uh, approach here, um, as well as some work from Thomas uh, Tordier uh, at 7T. Um, and here you see a sort of inversion of the pattern you're seeing with the gray matter suppression um, uh, with the white matter uh, suppression. Now, uh, an important um, aspect that comes in here is uh, what we get when you go to higher fields. Uh, and so for T1, um, I'm showing you here the, the recovery curves at 3T. Uh, and here, uh, a reference for the recovery curves at 7T. So what happens uh, in general is that the T1s become longer. Uh, and they tend to be better separated. Although that's, there's a, quite a large variability in terms of the T1 values that have, have been estimated uh, in the literature, uh, but that's, that's the tendency. And with that comes the benefit of a little bit more flexibility in how we scan. So how we scan and how much we scan along these, these curves and potentially the ability to get better contrast. Uh, and one remarkable development um, that has been done at 7T, uh, or that originally was proposed at 7T, taking advantage of this, 
uh, is what we call the MP2 range. So the conventional MP range, which is used at, as, uh, at many field strengths, uh, acquires one K space uh, plane uh, at, at a given inversion um, at a specific inversion time, centered uh, at a specific inversion time. Uh, at 70, um, because of this longer uh, uh, recovery, we have the ability to acquire more. And so um, this work proposed the, uh, acquiring two um, k-space planes, uh, the same k-space plane, but at different inversion times, uh, and then combining them with a complex uh, division. And what's uh, very advantageous here is that um, because uh, the flip angles used uh, in each of these uh, um, the, the two uh, uh, plane acquisitions and the TR um, will also um, create some differentiation in the signal that is very dependent on its T1. So based on simulations, we can find the optimal inversion times and optimal flip angles for either uh, plane to maximize contrast within a range of T1s that is of our interest. Um, at the same time, this division cancels out uh, some artifacts that tend to affect um, images, especially at 70. So we get uh, a benefit on contrast that we can optimize more flexibly than with a single uh, inversion time, and a benefit of uh, canceling out some of these artifacts, such as B1 and homogeneities. Um, and so the original work proposed uh, a contrast that uh, tries to, um, that covers both uh, gray matter, white matter, and CSF, which has a, a little bit farther apart uh, in T1. Um, very nice images. And later on, uh, Joseph, the author, uh, also explored a more specific contrast, actually, that um, is uh, focused more narrowly on T1s of gray matter and white matter. And then we go uh, back into the situation uh, in the thalamus where we see this nice contrast between medial and lateral um, sites with the actual benefit of canceling out artifacts with this mp 2 range approach. Um, and so overall, this is an overview of, of T1 based modalities. I'm just putting here uh, um, the ones that I've talked about before. Uh, just to show you that overall, uh, the dominant feature seems to be this uh, medial to lateral uh, contrast, which is, again, coming back to the histology, consistent uh, with the myelin stainings. Of course, I don't mean to say that uh, myelin is the only factor dominating here. It's actually, the, the anatomy of the thalamus is very complicated, uh, but it does seem to be a good uh, hypothesis, and, and it may be that it, it is dominant factor in here. Uh, moving on now to the uh, susceptibility-based modalities, uh, just to provide some basis. Uh, magnetic susceptibility is a property of, of tissues and materials, not just living tissues. Um, and we can divide them uh, into uh, different categories. Um, here are two of them, uh, uh, materials that are diamagnetic. These are materials so um, it's a property that defines how a material reacts when uh, in the presence of an external magnetic field. That's what's being represented by these um, blue lines here. Um, and diamagnetic materials will tend to counter uh, the applied field, creating a field of their own that is uh, uh, um, contrary to uh, the external one. Uh, so you, you'd see uh, in this representation as a widening, uh, less density of field lines. Uh, uh, in and around the object. Paramagnetic materials will do the opposite. They will reinforce the field, creating a field that adds up to the external one. Uh, and so um, different tissues in the brain have different susceptibility, and that creates contrast when we um, apply modalities that are sensitive to this, what we call P2-star contrast, such as uh, great intercold echo at larger echo times. It also has an impact not just on the magnitude, but on the phase, and I'll get a bit more uh, into that later, but it's a very important effect uh, as well. Uh, and notably, this is a, a, a source of contrast that gets greatly enhanced uh, at higher fields, not just because of a general increase in signal to noise ratio, but also because of an increase in the contrast itself. And that is because um, the field perturbations that are generated by the external field are proportional to the susceptibility of the tissue and to that field, that external field itself. So as you go to higher B0s, uh, this effect is enhanced. And here's a very nice demonstration uh, from Mark Ladd 
and colleagues uh, comparing um, just T2 star contrast uh, between uh, 1.5 and standard Tesla. Uh, and yeah, from this image, I, I'm showing this zoom panel here. So it's quite striking, as you can see. Um, and in the thalamus, it's been found uh, in a somewhat serendipitous uh, manner that um, this type of contrast, particularly susceptibility weighted imaging, um, uh, actually it appears to be able to discern uh, many features uh, um, in the thalamus that are consistent with what we expect uh, from the anatomy. Um, and so here I'm showing for susceptibility weighted imaging and here another work um, uh, using multi-echo GRE to then extract different properties, uh, uh, including the susceptibility itself uh, and R2 star. And you can see that uh, susceptibility um, again uh, has um, very interesting uh, features inside the thalamus. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that uh, a little bit more in detail later, but um, indeed, um, if we try to think about what might be creating this contrast, as I said, the observations were somewhat empirical. Uh, they weren't based by, uh, they weren't uh, started by a hypothesis, uh, at least that I know of. Um, but it, we know that susceptibility is sensitive to uh, microstructure and particularly myelinated uh, fibers, uh, very sensitive to certain forms of iron in the brain, uh, as well as calcifications. And, um, from a point of view of, of um, uh, more related to function, it is sensitive to the presence of the oxyhemoglobin. So it makes it very interesting for monography applications and uh, for fMRI, it's the basis of the bold effect. Um, so uh, it's one potential, um, perhaps the, the main uh, source of uh, contrast in the thalamus may be um, combination of microstructure and perhaps mainly iron. Um, and here I'm showing you um, a histological staining uh, for iron, uh, precisely. Just going to increase the contrast a little bit. And you can see exactly the dominant uh, features that we see in SWI or GSM, for example. Um, uh, you see the pulvinar, you see the VC here uh, as well. Um, the um, uh, CE and parafascicular uh, here in the middle. Uh, a differentiation also between the VIM um, and more frontal uh, nuclei. So it may be that iron is, is uh, a very important source of this contrast. Um, unfortunately, there are not so many uh, good histological data sets uh, stained for iron um, that would help us uh, uh, look into this uh, with a little bit more detail. But I leave this, uh, this here that, we've, that we found. Um, and so starting with susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, this is a T2 star weighted acquisition. So it, it uses a GRE sequence for again the cold echo with a long echo time and no spin refocusing. So to, to have the T2 star, not just T2 uh, uh, contrast. Uh, and it combines magnitude and phase information. I'll get into detail later. And that combination and its parameters were optimized to image veins. Uh, venography is the main, the primary uh, application of SWI. The finding that it is good for the thalamus, or that is interesting in the thalamus, uh, came later and, and wasn't at the, at, the, at the base of the development of this technique. So when we first got to this, and that was, yeah, work uh, started with Mary, and that was actually brought by, by them. Um, we thought of, oh, th this was just to show you that, uh, again, SWI is greatly enhanced at higher fields, um, as you can see here, uh, with exquisite uh, sensitivity for veins uh, at 70. Uh, and so uh, when we looked at this for the thalamus, we thought uh, maybe this, the way SWI is created in this combination of magnitude and phase could be optimized uh, to better image the thalamus because it was not the case when it was first developed. So we looked um, at this combination and I'll be describing you here, uh, it's done. So you start with the magnitude and the phase uh, data for the same image. Uh, here we obtain the phase image. Uh, I, I won't go into details, but we apply a pipeline of, of processing that lets us get uh, an image of the phase uh, that is free from singularities from um, the received fields of the, uh, the RF array, which is often a problem, especially at 7T. Um, but it allows to get a, a single coil combined phase image devoid of irregularities and of 
complicated um, phase, uh, uh, phase variations that are due to the coils. The phase then needs to be uh, high pass filtered. Um, and, and there comes a parameter that is tunable. So the, the scale of this high pass filtering. Uh, and then it is masked. So um, it, it scaling of minus pi to plus pi is then um, transformed into the scaling where anything negative uh, is, is um, set at one and the rest linearly scaled uh, down to zero. Uh, and then this um, phase mask is, is coming to multiply uh, into the magnitude image, enhancing uh, certain features, especially uh, the veins. One thing we added for our work is because we weren't actually interested in the veins, uh, we, so we tried to remove them actually. Uh, for this, we used a, what is called a vesselness filter uh, that has been proposed that um, sensitive to structures that are vessel like, so they're tubular uh, like, and that can identify these. And then we use these masks to identify veins and uh, remove them by interpolation. Uh, so that comes in, uh, and then you get an image that is almost devoid of veins um, and retains other contrast features. Uh, just to show here um, the effectiveness of this filter, it, it is quite good. It, it depends on, on certain uh, free parameters, so uh, it doesn't get everything. Uh, it's always a trade-off between um, overestimation and underestimation, of course. Uh, but we set it at parameters that were quite effective for the thalamus. So you can see here examples of an image before uh, this process of identification and removal, and then afterwards. And you can see that um, non-vein features of the contrast are retained. Uh, then most of, most of the veins are excluded. Uh, then once that's done, we can play with uh, two of these parameters of the phase magnitude combination. One is the amount or the number of multiplications that we do with the phase mask into the magnitude. And the other is the amount of high pass filtering that we do on the phase. And so you can see that um, the more permissive we are with um, the filtering, meaning the higher the sigma, which is the scale of, of, the, of the filter, um, and the more multiplications we do, the stronger the contrast becomes. Um, and what I'm showing here in blue and in green, blue would be the conventional SWR contrast, and green would be uh, an enhanced version that we had a look at um, when pushing these parameters more towards something that appears to be more effective for the talent. And so here is three, uh, three examples for three subjects. Um, of the sequence, and we can see a very good consistency um, with uh, a thalamic atlas from uh, Schottenbrand. Um, so showing that with a relatively straightforward uh, um, change in the uh, SWI reconstruction, we can um, uh, highlight, enhance uh, the contrast in the talent. This also motivated us to go a little bit further and go to the actual property um, that generates this contrast susceptibility itself, which can be estimated by QSM, quantitative susceptibility mapping. Uh, and so just briefly uh, explaining this, um, we know from uh, treating, uh, looking at the physics uh, of how susceptibility generates uh, or disturbs the field, uh, we know that a certain distribution of susceptibility creates a certain uh, distribution of a field, which then is measured as phase uh, in the MRI. So in order to get this, what we measure is the phase, and then we need to solve an inverse problem to get, um, to estimate uh, the susceptibility that created that observation. Uh, and so this requires several processing steps. Uh, the phase needs to be unwrapped because the phase we measure is wrapped at uh, every uh, two pi. Um, and then we, uh, it is typically also as a contribution from what we call background field. So it's uh, contributions to the field distortions that come from susceptibility sources outside the brain and which we are not interested in. Um, and so we, we need to remove that with appropriate methods to uh, keep just a phase that is generated by the local uh, susceptibility. Uh, and then we need to solve the inverse problem. So go in this direction uh, here. That inverse problem has been shown to be well approximated by uh, essentially a linear fil filter uh, step uh, that takes us from um, 
a certain distribution of susceptibility to this uh, phase, which has this um, dipolar uh, geometry. Uh, and that is well expressed as a multiplication in K space in the frequency domain. Uh, the dipole being expressed by this uh, term here uh, that allows that is multiplying the susceptibility to give us the phase we measure. One problem is that uh, to recover this, uh, the problem becomes ill posed because uh, there is a cone in K space where um, this term here becomes null, becomes zero. And so we cannot uh, know for sure uh, what susceptibility generated. Uh, the phase at those regions of k-space. So it becomes ill-posed. Um, it can be solved by either acquiring multiple scans with different head orientations so that the susceptibility rotates with respect uh, to this cone, to the field, um, or acquiring a single orientation but adding regularization, some regularization term that is uh, effective in, in dealing with this problem. And many have been proposed. And so this is a, a result. Uh, from a pilot we've tried um, ourselves and we were convinced. Uh, you can see the features uh, that, that I'd shown uh, before um, in those publications and we've seen them too and it looks quite nice. So we, we were quite convinced. Um, comparing to SWI, uh, the, the advantage here of course is that we're looking at really the underlying property that generates uh, these effects. Uh, it is a quantitative uh, measure uh, susceptibility given in uh, parts per million here with respect to the field. Um, it uh, allows uh, isotropic resolution, whereas uh, SWI is um, more favorably done with quiet and isotropic voxels. Um, the disadvantages would be, of course, that it requires heavier processing and this ill posedness of, of the scan. One other uh, important uh, observation is that the features we see here are quite different from those that we see in the T1 modalities. The dominant variations are quite different. So that led us to uh, ask the questions and conduct the work um, that we are doing now. Um, and um, essentially the question is there, how do all these modalities compare? Uh, are there optimal choices? Um, can we find a choice that gives us the best uh, uh, results for our, for our studies. Uh, and how much, how much can we distinguish? What nuclei can we distinguish uh, so far with this state of the art? Uh, so what we've done is, uh, what we're doing um, is um, implementing, setting up uh, many of these modalities that I've covered so far uh, and scanning them in the same brains of the same individuals to have the exact same anatomy across all the contrast. We're doing this at 7T um, at sub millimeter resolution. And here are the um, contrasts that we are covering. I'll go into a little bit more detail on them. So we have T1 base modalities, uh, including the conventional contrasts of MP2 rage, T1 map given by the same uh, sequence, and then the wide matter null um, MP rage approach, and this uh, MP2 rage optimized for great white matter. Uh, contrast. Uh, we also have some T2-based modalities, also, although I didn't go into that, uh, we thought it'd be nice to add. So um, the conventional contrast, um, which we've set up here with the, with the 3D space uh, sequence and the Terra, um, which is a variable to the panel uh, turbo spin echo sequence. Uh, and a inversion recovery TSC, uh, which has been proposed for the thalamus by Kanowski and, and colleagues. Um, which is actually a mix of T1 and T2 uh, uh, contributions. Uh, but so it, it is uh, essentially um, 3D space, but with an inversion recovery uh, before and acquiring at a TI of, of uh, inversion time of 500 uh, milliseconds and with quite an isotropic uh, voxels. Uh, the susceptibility based modalities were the two that um, I've described before. So SWI and QSM. Where here we have we we did multiple head orientations to get um, to solve the post problem uh, in this way. Um, one important thing to keep in mind, especially at 7T, is that the B1 field is not homogeneous, homogeneous, and in particular um, with with this the Nova coil with single transmit um, that we've been using, and that many centers have, perhaps the most widely used one. Um, is that uh, the um, B1 plus at the center of the brain, which contains the thalamus, tends to be higher than the average 
And so uh, when you let your scanner um, calibrate automatically, it will typically overshoot uh, the flip angle uh, for the thalamus. So we take a B1 map, we look at um, what's, what's the difference with respect to the nominal flip angle, and we adjust the transmit voltage accordingly, manually, um, to, get, to get the closest possible uh, to the flip angle um, in the thalamus. Uh, although we acquire whole brain, we thought that would be still uh, nice to have. Uh, so for processing, the idea is to get these images in some sort of alignment that lets us uh, compare them directly with uh, between each other and uh, with known atlases. Uh, so one step is registration within the subject, where we take as reference uh, the white matter null uh, modality. The reason for that is so that we can then apply the Thomas method to bring um, Morel-based atlas uh, with nonlinear registration into uh, the same space uh, the, using the white matter null as reference and then having all the other contrasts aligned with that. Uh, one other atlas we're looking at so far is the Shelton brand. Uh, and for this, we uh, register everything to MNI uh, space via using the ICDM data as reference uh, for alignment with Shelton brand. And we focus on one particular slice uh, of it. And so here are the results. I'm showing you the correspondence to the morale based atlas uh, for three slices, and that I'm showing and giving you a reference for here. Looking at uh, conventional T1 weighted and the T1 map, uh, we start seeing this um, variation that I had uh, shown before. Uh, and this gets best image then with uh, the white matter suppressed, and especially with the MP2 rage optimized for great white matter contrast. So you can see in comparison with the Atlas, very good uh, agreement with um, the Atlas on some of these regions, very good contrast. Uh, and again, this uh, medial to lateral uh, difference. The susceptibility modalities um, for the R2-star map, uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, very informative. That's consistent with uh, previous publications. QSM, again, quite nice uh, um, uh, for many of these nuclei quite consistent with uh, the act, what we expect from the Atlas. Uh, SWI, also good. Uh, I would say a little bit uh, less uh, um, sensitive, uh, but again, consistent with what, with, with what has been observed. Um, the T2 modalities were so far not very informative. I would say we have not really managed to um, reproduce the results of Kanowski uh, and colleagues for the inversion recovery uh, TSC. Uh, possibly because our implementation is based on space sequence and is a little bit different. We're still working on this, but so far we can't really conclusively say that it adds uh, value. Here I'm showing uh, uh, the results, the images against uh, the Shelton brand for this particular slice that we usually like a lot because it contains the VIM and many other nuclei. Uh, and again, uh, it, it is consistent with the observations for Morel. So with um, uh, MP2 rage optimized for gray to white matter contrast uh, being the most effective of the T1 based modalities, QSM on the susceptibility side, uh, also very informative um, and with pretty good consistency um, uh, from a visual inspection. Uh, now the question is how can we compare this in a bit more systematic way uh, and look at this question of which modalities are best and which ones can we stick to uh, if we want to be pragmatic and get good information about the thalamic nuclei uh, without having to go through uh, 10 different uh, acquisitions of the same subject. Um, so yeah, this question of which modality is the most valuable. Um, one preliminary indication already is that it will depend on the purpose and more specifically on the nuclei that we're interested in. Uh, as we can see from these two um, examples here. Uh, the other question is how can we do this in an objective way, quantify this ability to distinguish nuclei? Uh, one, perhaps the most direct idea would be uh, obtaining a summary metric per nucleus uh, or per pair of nuclei, uh, such as the contrast to noise ratio. And um, this carries some problems. The, the first one would be uh, that if the atlas alignment is not uh, perfect, we would be including uh, intensities in this estimate of the summary metrics, intensities that are not from the region itself. And of course, the alignment to the atlas is never perfect. 
Uh, but we could uh, try to work around this with um, metrics that are robust, for example, very simply re replacing means by, by medians or um, looking at um, inner regions of, of inner subregions of, of the ROI uh, or weighing by the distance uh, to the center of, of the ROI. Uh, but another problem and the most limiting one I would say is that in fact, not all the differentiation that we can see uh, by visual inspection comes necessarily from differences in intensity of the regions. That would be, of course, the case for many of these uh, regions uh, here, for example. But if you look at QSM, much of this differentiation comes from contours, in fact, rather than intensity difference between the regions. If you'd compare these two regions that I'm uh, covering here with my mouse, you'd, you'd find that uh, the intensities of the two are very similar yet there is a good contour uh, separating them. Because of that, we haven't really, it remains an open problem for us. We haven't really found a good objective uh, or quantitative uh, way of doing so. Our approach uh, for now has been to gather some observers with experience in looking at the landmark images, having each of them individually uh, consider every pair of nuclei that are neighbors, that are adjacent, um, and having the person for each of those pairs choose the modality or modalities that best differentiate the pair, if any is able to do so. And that leads, uh, and then once you have that, you find some conservative consensus where you take uh, the common uh, decisions um, from the experts uh, to reach a sort of consensus. Uh, and so here I'm showing such a consensus from only two, uh, two observers uh, so far for um, the Morel Atlas and for Shelton Brand for that slice that I showed Shelton Brand. Uh, and so these half matrices are uh, essentially comparing every, uh, every nuclei, uh, nucleus with, with every other nucleus. Uh, and then the, the dark blue uh, uh, boxes are the ones where they are actually adjacent. Um, and so the main two observations we take from here is that essentially every pair of adjacent nuclei can be distinguished with either QSM or MP2 rage optimized for gray to white matter contrast and very few neighboring nuclei cannot. So that's the nuns that are shown here. Very few cases that can't really be differentiated by any of these uh, sequences. And so to um, um, the conclusion so far is, to our knowledge, this is the most comprehensive evaluation uh, being done to date of structural imaging modalities for, for differentiating the thalamic nuclei. Uh, we do confirm that conventional contrasts are quite limited in their ability to do this. Uh, and for the modalities we've tested, uh, QSM and this optimized version of MP2H are the most valuable options together being able to distinguish uh, almost every pair of nuclei that we've, that we've covered. Um, the next steps, uh, what's coming next, we are still working on some optimizations of certain sequences. I'll just go into that relatively briefly here. One of them is bringing the optimized mp 2 h since it's been found quite valuable uh, to a better resolution. We've, we've been working at 0 0.85 um, where, um, Sorry, this is not, uh, what I mean here with conventional is not the contrast, but the uh, sequence uh, itself. Um, the reason we can't go uh, much farther is because in this optimized version, the, the, the inversion times are quite close together. So they're quite packed uh, and you don't have a lot of space to, um, to sample uh, case space. Uh, but a way to get around this has been with a, an emerging version of, of the MP2 rage, which is, has become a product or is about to, I, I think, uh, at the Terra, uh, which uses compressed sensing instead of uh, traditional um, undersampling with Grappa. Um, and so it, it gives you a lot more flexibility. This is, um, this is looking at uh, uh, the two phase encoding directions um, uh, on each axis, and each point is a line through the, through the slide, uh, a readout line. Uh, and so for each inversion time, you would scan, you would do one of these trajectories, one of these lines. So instead of a case-based plane, you do these sort of uh, bent uh, trajectories, which allows some jittering. And, and because the um, density can be controlled uh, and so on, it allows us a lot more flexibility um, um, with what we can do uh, within the TI. Uh, and so here's an example that we, 
implemented uh, recently that lets us get to the resolution of most of the other uh, sequences with a certain time penalty, but I would say not, not uh, enormous. Um, and you can see the image is noisier as, as it would be expected. Um, the regularization factors uh, in the compressed sensing reconstruction have not been optimized yet for, uh, for this particular uh, case. That's one thing. The other thing is that, in fact, some of the things you see here that in this single slice might look like noise actually have a continuity across slices. So they actually um, uh, seem to be real features. Uh, so it's actually quite nice. Um, Another thing we're looking at, although I'm not sure how far we'll be able to get with this, is that I said um, the T1 weighted, T2 weighted contrast is relatively limited uh, in terms of what it offers, the information it offers. But we can see amidst the noise um, if you really squint really well. <laughs> and if you look at a lot of these images uh, uh, in your daily life, um, that there are indeed some, some variations, some nuclei, um, potentially nuclei, Appearing here, so we've looked at um, trying to improve the SNR, essentially reducing the, the, the resolution and the acceleration. And then it, you start seeing these features appearing more clearly. Um, again, still uh, quite heavily in noise, but maybe there's, there's something uh, that can be done. So maybe we can have a, a more fair uh, evaluation of, of this contrast uh, by improving this a little bit further. Um, other steps is, of course, to expand this. Uh, what I've shown you so far is just for one subject, one brain that we've been uh, scanning. Um, I think the total now is two to three hours for, for those contrasts we have, but we had to spend a lot more time uh, optimizing uh, the, the protocols. And um, uh, we, we'll be looking at different atlases as well, such as this one from Iglesias that is uh, integrated in the pre-surfer pipeline. So, uh, um, will be quite nice to, to have it. Um, we're looking at uh, more extensively at the literature in terms of histology to try to um, see what else we can say uh, or, or infer about uh, these features we see from the different contrasts. Uh, and um, if you guys have any ideas about how to make a more quantitative evaluation of this ability to distinguish between different nuclei, um, so that we can give a more quantitative uh, comparison of sequences. Uh, it's very welcome uh, if you have suggestions. Um, the final uh, question, uh, which I'm asked quite often, is, uh, is there a way to combine modalities, especially those two, QSM and optimize MP2 rage, that seem to gather the best uh, results uh, into one that uh, could be used uh, to rule them all? Uh, and we're only starting now to look at that. Of course, it depends on your, on your application. If you're looking at, say, a clustering method, for example, you may be able to work with uh, uh, non-scalar uh, data, so with vectors per voxel, and then it's relatively trivial to combine the two images, getting it a 2D um, um, uh, data. Um, but if you want to look at pure uh, visualization, um, then I'm just showing here, this is not really, it's more of an entertainment slide than, <laughs> than um, uh, really a very objective evaluation. It's just things we've been, uh, we've been playing with, uh, combining the two contrasts. Uh, so the, the first row, I'm showing you the MP2 rage, optimized MP2 rage uh, modality, QSM in the middle, and then the combination. Uh, in this example, I've, we've looked at RGB um, uh, channels, so color images, uh, combining so using uh, uh, one for the blue channel, the other for the red channel, uh, as you can see here, uh, green instead. Uh, I would say that green gives you a nicer, um, clearer uh, combination. It, it's easier, at least to me, to uh, look at what's coming from the two uh, channels. Uh, although the other one is perhaps more visually pleasing. Uh, I'd say another option is to look at um, hue and saturation value uh, instead. Uh, this is one such attempt. Um, and I know many people do not want to go into color um, scales, so staying with gray scales, uh, one idea here is uh, using essentially multiplying the QSM by um, the MP2 rage, which essentially is going to darken uh, the more uh, medial regions. And that's what happens here. If you look at the more medial uh, regions of the QSM, they're getting uh, downplayed. But there's, there's a lot to do with this. And of course, we'll need to uh, have a more um, 
methodical, methodical I'd say, <laughs> more systematic, more objective way of, of looking into this, but it's something we'll be looking into. Uh, so just to finish with uh, what, what I called our multi-contrasted uh, contributors, um, because they uh, have very different backgrounds. We have MRI experts, image processing experts, clinical experts, um, and um, uh, special mention to uh, Christina, my PhD student, who has been doing most of the really hands-on work here, working uh, on the acquisitions and uh, registration and the comparison to atlases. Uh, she's really done most of the hands-on work. Um, and finally, thank you uh, for your attention.